Good afternoon. Um, welcome to uh, this afternoon's session on food industry trends and process technologies. Uh, my name is Luke Cooperhouse. I'm the director at the Rutgers University Food Innovation Center. Um, we also have a booth uh, at, at number 951 um, in the process university section. And uh, happy to talk to anybody afterwards. And um, I want to also uh, recognize Julie Elmer. Where did you go, Julie? Oh, there she is in the front row who's our Associate Director of Food Technology for our center. And uh, I also want to recognize that uh, there's an individual in the front, uh, Dimitri, who's uh, doing some uh, recording or translation for some international visitors that are here. So you want to make sure that people don't think he's rude. Uh, he's just uh, helping out folks who, who don't understand English. Um, so again, welcome to everybody. <clears throat> and, and in my role at Rutgers, uh, and I'm actually speaking again tomorrow about food incubators, uh, our, our Rutgers program actually, uh, the Food Innovation Center actually is a business incubator and accelerator program that's part of the State University of New Jersey. Uh, I'm also very active in business incubators on a global basis um, and how we can all work together because incubators are in fact a tremendous resource for both a startup company and established company uh, by providing them a great deal of services from marketing, sales, product development, quality assurance, regulations, labeling, uh, and so forth. Uh, and secondly, uh, many of us offer a physical uh, FDA and USDA inspected space in which products can be manufactured for sale to the public. So it's a great way to uh, develop a new business and the ultimate goal of a, of a university incubator, uh, true to the university, is to graduate companies to be self-sustaining uh, and after you've proven the viability of your business. So more about that tomorrow, so please come to that session uh, if you're interested. Uh, today's topic is really about trends and technologies. And I have a lot of slides here. So I'll tell you in advance, and I understand the slides will be made available. I don't know the methodology for how that will be made available. Um, but to, uh, to folks at this conference, you'll be able to access that information. Um, so if you can't write down all this information, that will be something you could grab later. Um, but I want to begin this conversation today by just talking about kind of an order of magnitude. The food industry is uh, very large. In the U.S., it's uh, been recognized, according to the uh, USDA Economic Research Service, at a value of about $1.5 trillion, um, employing a lot of people. About 10% of, uh, of our GDP uh, uh, is, comes from the food industry. Um, and as you see in this graph, it's kind of interesting. Uh, the two colors there are food consumed uh, or purchased for at-home usage for versus uh, food that's uh, purchased for away from home, meaning food service or some other, other use. So as like all of us in this room, we're all increasingly busy. Uh, many of us don't know at 5 p.m. what we're going to have for dinner. Um, so this whole uh, complexity in our lives and the two earner households and busier lifestyles have led to a different type of food that's now uh, needs to be made available for folks that are on the run and are seeking convenience. So those are some of the trends I'll speak about. So this kind of helps uh, lay the foundation for that. I also want to acknowledge that there's a lot of activity in this space. So, so investors are putting money um, into the food industry like never before. Um, so as this slide uh, documents, uh, in the year 2014, $2.4 billion of private capital was invested into this food ecosystem, which is 42% greater than 2013, and twice as much uh, of the year before of 2012. So it's growing at a bit of an exponential pace here. There was uh, an article in the New York Times uh, last year that says something like, what if the next best thing doesn't happen on your smartphone or in the cloud? What if it happens right on your plate? So, so there's a lot of interest uh, in, in a, uh, what historically was not that exciting industry uh, of the food industry uh, versus tech and we're seeing a lot of movement in this sector. And in fact, um, there, I have a little, little card up here for those that are interested. This November 16th, uh, we're, all, we're actually having uh, what we call Rutgers X. It's an accelerator conference in which uh, uh, entrepreneurs are pitching uh, to the food industry, um, other entrepreneurs, uh, venture capitalists. It's a major networking event. There'll be about 300 people there. It's in New Brunswick, New Jersey. It's during Global Entrepreneurship Week. So again, for those interested, 
We have a website, x.ruckers.edu, for more information, but also there's a card here to remind you. Um, so what I want to talk to you today is about helping you and your company determine what's called your USP, your unique selling position. It's what makes you stand out for the competition. So whether you're hiring a person, you think through the same thing. You know, why did you hire one person over another? So as, as, as incubator managers, our job is to find the type of company that really is distinctive. So this conversation today is about how you can make your company the product you might be working on on behalf of your company, or maybe you're an entrepreneur, or maybe you're in the equipment business and you're looking to differentiate your, your piece of equipment in some way. It's all the same thing. What is your concept? What's your elevator pitch? What makes it unique? What problem does it solve? What benefits allow you to, to make your product uh, or service stand out from the rest? So I'm going to uh, really deal with this conversation in two pieces. Talk to you first about trends, and then talk to you about technologies, both of which should be integrated to make your product, your business stand out from the rest. So all of us are consumers too, right? So we go to the store, uh, we see all these words that describe products. They're differentiated, they taste great, they're decadent, they're exotic, they're artisanal, they're experiential, they're bold. They might be non-GMO, they might uh, be, have a sustainable message, it might be organic, they might be functional. Um, where do you go? What words are really important? What are consumers looking for? How can you make your product distinctive? How can you leverage some of these words in your messaging to make your product stand out? Similarly, there's lots of ways to sell a product. There's a, a significant, there's a huge, actually, retail marketplace, uh, supermarkets of all forms, uh, convenience stores, uh, even supermarkets, convenience stores, both sell at the commodity, more basic level, to the more adventurous, ethnic, bold, higher price level. So all things are possible, from products that, uh, uh, frankly, might have a fair amount of competition, they're a little bit more generic, but there's a huge growth in this whole category, which I'll describe, called specialty foods. Um, similarly, there's a food service market um, where your product can be sold to what you know, it may be, seem obvious as restaurants or for catering purposes, but you also might have a product that is, in fact, a component for a food service use. So, so maybe you're selling, make it up, a, a pre-cut cabbage that could be used to make coleslaw in a food service deli department at a supermarket. So again, there's various ways in which your product can fit in the marketplace. Um, and similarly, what I call further processing or industrial sales. So you're providing some value added ingredient. Maybe a good example is like uh, you're a farmer who doesn't really want to get into uh, selling to retail or even creating a product, but they want to get more value. But maybe they could do diced peppers that would be sold to somebody else, an entrepreneur who wants to make salsa. Um, so again, it's, uh, they're selling a value-added uh, component to an upstream food processor. So back to the food industry. Um, many of us, in, in, in back to high school or even before that, you know, we, we learn about the food industry. Food, we all learned, is this basic building block. You know, frankly, it's a very boring very scientific academic definition of food. It's about carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, and minerals, things that we need to produce energy. Yes, that's all true. And that's what Wikipedia and Encyclopedia Britannica will tell you the food is even today. I say that's not exactly true. So I say food is actually what I call the currency of life's experiences. Food is about life. Food's about social gatherings. Food is about emotion. So how can you, as food industry veterans or entrepreneurs, you know, really communicate that food is, uh, to create the value that we're talking about, is about memories, experiences. Norman Rockwell kind of did in this picture here. Um, you know, all these great emotions that we have about food that you might think about as you think about events in your own life. You might also you know, buy food because of your personal, your cultural, or your religious beliefs. You might also uh, buy food because it's a reward. Uh, you go and get that, uh, maybe the only time you go to Ben and Jerry's and get that uh, decadent uh, double fudge three scoop brownie sundae uh, is to reward yourself. Then you feel bad the next day, but you know, it, it's all part of your, your own self you know, uh, reward that you might do. Food is also about love. It's about relationships. We're giving gifts around food. 
And Hippocrates said it very well that food be thy medicine. So food has taken on new, new levels of interest uh, as the intersection of food and biotech and life science intersect in the future, uh, where functional food will take on even new definitions. So again, I'm really uh, uh, trying to communicate that food is really um, much broader than a scientific definition, and the more you can incorporate you know, this type of thinking into your process and your communication strategy will really help differentiate your product again from the rest. So this is us on any given day, looking left, looking right, which product do I buy? I never bought this before. I have no loyalty to this product. Um, so this guy in the bottom center, he's can looking, maybe he's looking at, maybe he's looking at nutrition facts. Maybe he's looking at the story that's being told. Maybe he's reading the ingredient statement and he doesn't like, you know, a high fructose corn syrup or something else or too much sodium. Um, some people, this is you, this is your consumer making a decision. How, how do you, again, stand out from the rest? So I'm going to describe eight different types of, you know, uh, things to think about that uh, are all pretty core to some of the trends that I want to discuss with you today. Um, differentiation, freshness, local, convenience, variety, sensory stimulation, social environmental responsibility, and, and functionality. Not all of these are required for every product. Maybe just one of these is important enough. But certainly when you can integrate many of these ideas into your business proposition, you can in fact you know, create that experience that I've described. So when I talk about product differentiation, uh, a couple examples here. So like this one on the top left, you know, honey. Honey's been around since, uh, uh, what, the Stone Age, right? You know, v you know since the b beginning of mankind. Um, so honey's hard to differentiate, arguably. But here's actually an award-winning product from the Specialty Food Association that kind of runs the fancy food show that uses four adjectives before the word honey. You know, it's white honey. It's organic white honey. It's rare Hawaiian organic white honey. Again, award-winning product, the business is doing very well. So they took a, a very familiar product and they differentiated it in not one way, but a variety of ways, and even communicated its rareness, um, and, and also uh, the locale in which it originated. This is a product I saw, uh, you know, a caramel apple donut or bacon on donuts. So again, we're seeing this, you know, foods that we're very familiar with, you know, that we're offering in a, in a new twist. This product on the right is actually uh, a, a one of the clients at a Rutgers Food Innovation Center. Uh, and, and this particular entrepreneur actually won the Outstanding Cold Beverage Award about two to three years after he launched from, this, from the specialty food show, fancy food show organization. It's called a Sophie Award. And um, this product is actually made from, uh, I got a little issue on my computer here going. Technical difficulty here. Oh, there it is. Thanks for that. Um, anyway, so um, this product is called Ginger. Actually, contains uh, kind of a new type of uh, functional beverage, which has uh, ginger, uh, brew tea, um, a little cayenne pepper. So it's just a, a very distinctive product. Again, you see some of the words here. They're adventurous. They're indulgent. Proprietary. Unique exotic, authentic. These are the kind of words that might communicate differentiation. Uh, the second one I want to really re refer to is freshness. And I'll jump ahead. The next one I'll refer to is local. So freshness and local kind of intersect. Um, but they are unique words that I want to talk about separately. So according to this um, uh, uh, A.T. Kearney analysis, just uh, very recent actually, uh, they indicate that freshness is far and away the most important purchasing criteria for consumers when buying foods. Um, you can see this kind of people's perception of what freshness means depends in part on what they're buying. Do they expect eggs to be fresh? Of course. You know, do they expect canned foods to be fresh? Of course not. But they actually looked at these various categories and it indicated uh, when, when freshness versus local and other words uh, have you know, the most appeal. And, and they actually indicate that 30% of respondents don't differentiate between fresh and local, uh, and certainly in particular categories. But I want to just point out that freshness is a very important uh, criterion in, in purchase uh, 
uh, intent. And local, this is kind of has a, a New Jersey slant here, but you can see how you know, we're communicating the word local in the state of New Jersey, whether it's on the bottom left, the state branding strategy of Jersey Fresh, or whether it's communicating Jersey Fresh strawberries when they're in season, or, or, or a canned product that uses local raw materials when they're in season to produce that product. We also have a, a local ketchup uh, called First Field that again is one of our Rutgers clients, to uh, Flying Fish Brewery, the, we all, you know, many of us might be familiar with the, the exits on New Jersey, um, but exit nine is actually the, uh, which is the exit in which Rutgers uh, main campus is located, uh, has its own uh, brew uh, coming from, from that. And you can see whether it's wines or shellfish uh, or other categories, you know, locals communicate authentic, seasonal, traditional, maybe simpler type of product communication. Though Kearney did a really great analysis about local uh, what's really fascinating is that this particular analysis said that the value of local food uh, has been a, a, a relatively long, longer term issue, but in the last couple years alone, it has grown dramatically. What this communicates is that um, in, they broke down high income consumers, middle income consumers, and low income consumers. And, and as you see in this graph, from left to right, it said, would you pay greater than 10% up to 10%, up to 5%, or not interested. I would not pay a premium. So what they're showing here is that 30% um, of low and medium income workers will now pay up to 10% more for local, while almost 20% of high income earners are willing to pay more than 10%, twice the number of just a year ago. Um, and we've, we've learned at the Food Innovation Center that respondents from rural and small communities, which are closest to where food is grown, and the research that we've conducted will actually be pay, we're willing to pay more for local food than those from larger cities. But, you know, for example, bottom left, low-income consumers. This bar right here actually says 0% of low-income consumers would pay greater than 10%. Uh, and the colors are the green is 2013, that aqua blue is 2014, 11% in 2014. So even at the low-income consumer level, we're seeing people that are really willing to pay more than 10% more uh, for a product that communicated local versus one that did not. So again, against all categories, we're seeing growth. And again, local is certainly a big opportunity in how that gets communicated. Uh, again, convenience has been an issue for many years, in fact, decades, uh, arguably from, the, from uh, you know, uh, I think the kind of the, uh, uh, one of the m more better known convenient foods was the rise of frozen entrees uh, back in the uh, 50s and 60s. I believe it was Campbell's Soup that had a bunch of leftover turkeys after Thanksgiving. And they decided to make, uh, I believe it was the banquet or the Swanson brand of TV dinner, the first TV dinner. Then the advent of the microwave, uh, making that more affordable, resulted in this whole concept of, of a frozen uh, prepared entree. Um, that obviously has evolved considerably over time. But convenience today means even more than that, more than just I can cook it in the microwave. So convenience, one way to look at convenience is really looking at the three ways in which you may be involved in the food consumption itself. You may, in fact, purchase a product. You may not think of this, but it may be ready to eat. You know, meaning I can eat that food right this minute if I chose to, or later on when I may not have an opportunity to have a microwave around, I may want to eat in the car, I got no time, I may eat it while I walk. So that product that's ready to eat is the greatest convenient product. Um, and you know, that might be a, a prepared sandwich, that might be a fresh cut salad, uh, as kind of shown on the top side of this thing, or fresh cut fruit. Um, uh, you know, versus a product that, um, uh, it also could be a product sold in a heated state, like if you go to a convenience store, a 7-Eleven or a Wawa or a Circle K, what have you, um, you might be eating a hot dog that's off the grill. That's ready to eat, although it's actually heated in that form, but you can eat it right now, in fact. Um, uh, versus a product that's ready to heat, which requires you to use a microwave or something like that, or ready to cook, in which you need to uh, put together ingredients, uh, use an oven, it's a little bit more complex. It's all very relevant because you're seeing products in the market now like um, that actually fit in the cup holder, whether it's candy, uh, whether it's fruit, uh, there's been apples in a cup holder. Um, so there's various forms in which product can be made for the mobile consumer. 
Um, and the kind of the bottom right picture shows that this is a ready to cook product. So the message here as all categories, even though a ready to cook product is not nearly as convenient as ready to eat, but a ready to cook product uh, can in fact be far more convenient. For example, maybe it is a raw but marinated meat product. So we're seeing it's grill ready. So you don't need to go home and actually figure out what marinade to use. Somebody else has done, the, it provided the expertise to pre-marinate that for you. Again, everybody loves that model. Consumers like it because somebody figured it out for me. I don't need to buy another bottle. I might waste it or throw it out. Maybe to me it's a little bit more environmental in a way because it's all one-stop shopping. Um, stores like it because they're selling that marinating meat for more money per pound than the meat product. And you know they're making money on the marinade and getting the same value for that as the meat. Um, and of course the manufacturer likes that because they're making its value added. They're making more money for a commodity. They're differentiating their business from a commodity business. So again, in all categories of food, convenience uh, and how the consumer can maybe get involved or maybe not involved are all things to consider. Um, another element of convenience is just the, the reality that we're seeing food sold in new places. Um, so the traditional place, a supermarket, uh, where you might purchase food is not no longer necessarily uh, the, uh, the main location. So we're seeing a decline over time in supermarkets being the place of choice for products to be purchased. Um, it's very common in Europe, for example, to see sandwiches sold in subway stations, bookstores. Uh, you don't see sandwiches really sold at all, uh, except for convenience stores in the U.S. supermarket business. So, so it's just interesting around the world how prepared foods are sold in different channels. But now we're seeing here in the U.S., uh, Amazon has launched Amazon Fresh. There's Fresh Diet. There's Peapod. There's Fresh Direct. Uh, there, there's various ways in which we're seeing uh, stores either pick the products for you or deliver them to you. You're just a click away. Uh, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the iPhone that, or, or its competitor that we're all become very familiar with uh, is you know, offering a new way for us to purchase foods that didn't exist before. Um, it's, to me, it's, not a matter, it's a matter of time before Uber gets into food delivery business also. So I think that um, you know, as these new, new mechanisms for getting food delivered to the home is really opening, our, opening uh, new options for us to consider. Number five on our trends is really about variety. Um, I want to just communicate here that as a whole industry really focuses on health, I want to say that health is not the only thing we're all looking for. I described earlier, you know, obviously Ben and Jerry's is doing very well. Uh, so are all these healthy food concepts. But in the scheme of health, um, we're seeing products, and I'll talk about that under technology in a minute, that might be using like high pressure processing, like Evolution Fresh over there, uh, to introduce uh, new forms of healthy prepared foods. Health means different things to different people. So Coca-Cola, frankly, did a 100 calorie pack. It's not healthy, it's the same product, but it's portion controlled. So at least you as a, a mother, for example, of your kid in school are controlling the, the, the amount of calories that might be going into, into, into somebody. Um, so you know, whether that product is actually formulated to be healthy, it's nutritious, it's naturally, it's minimal processed, it's raw or it's gluten-free, preservative-free, or just as portion controlled, like even Pepperidge Farm chest men at a 100 calorie pack or it might have some ingredients that, you know, that promote satiety and make you full. These are all varying definitions of health. I want to communicate also indulgence. So I talked early about making your product taste great, the number one criterion that I've always heard for how people purchase, repurchase food, of, uh, trumps all other attributes is taste. Food must taste great uh, as something that will lead to the repeat purchase. Uh, that's actually a burger that I had once, it was quite good on the left. Um, pretty tall, but again, that was a day I felt indulgent. Uh, uh, the old childhood croissant, you can't, uh, the old standby for indulgence. This is actually a picture I thought was really kind of cool. It was actually in a casino in Atlantic City, uh, the Borgata, but it was very cool. They had a, a, a store called Fat Burger next to a store called Lettuce Head. You can see the line of Fat Burger. It was, it was about 20 times larger than Lettuce Head. So, so again, I know that's an indulgent kind of uh, a consumer at, at a casino. Um, but nonetheless, I thought that was kind of interesting. So at different times of day, we might you know, all, all have different things in our mind. I want to talk about sensory stimulation in kind of a new way. Um, I talked to you before about taste being the most powerful criterion for repeat purchase, but what makes us buy foods the first time? 
So we can't overlook this whole concept. It's psychology. It's perception. You know, frankly, it's how we might judge a person we see on the street. Uh, we all have a form of bias that we, some of us control better than others. It has to do with our foods we purchase, too. What makes you buy that purchase? You're using your senses. You, what you see, what you smell, what you might taste, how it might, the texture you might see, even by how you might use your hearing. Uh, and I'll describe that in a second. So I think you can't underestimate uh, that whole uh, aspect. For example, in the fresh prepared food category, where I spent a lot of my career, you see products that are more typically sold where you can actually, the consumer can actually visually see the product. So in the fresh meat case uh, or the fresh deli case, you'll notice that there's a lot of, you know, there might be some film companies here in the audience. Um, there's a lot of products that, you know, the, the, the visual clarity of the product is really important. I want to see those colors, uh, the whole concept of pulling a vacuum, you know, you know, not having condensation, all these little issues or little things to think about. So the product you know, really communicates freshness and your sensory uh, uh, reaction is as, as positive as possible. Here's just a couple of ways in which sensory stimulation is done. Um, having, earlier in my career, I had a chance to work in the supermarket industry, and I learned how they play with people's minds by uh, having rotisserie chicken in the back. They might have the bakery smells funnel through the ventilation system. They're working you over as you're walking through the store and getting a little hungry as you walk, buying more things because of that. Um, that's why you know, you're walking into stores, over 90% of supermarkets, when you walk into is the produce department. Vibrant colors popping in your face, communicating local, you know, local farms. You might then walk into the center of the store and the same thing you might see somewhere else. So stores are differentiating themselves too with all this vibrancy of colors and smells. They're, they're working you over. Um, they might have, uh, uh, as you see in the top right there, they might have uh, a sampling area. Uh, they might be you know, using coffee, and you can hear the chopping of the coffee, smelling the coffee. Um, you know, here's uh, uh, this is actually a picture from a Hale and Hardy store, uh, which is based in New York City, where they're right at the front of the store going chop, 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 chop. They're just they're li they're they're literally making noise, so they're 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 making you realize through that noise that it's fresh. Uh, or you might go in a fresh meat case and see this gorgeous looking uh, like a, a flanks tank pinwheel, whatever that might be. Uh, that's another one of my little donuts. I ate that one too on the bottom of that picture, which had bacon on it. But again, you're seeing texture, you're seeing color, um, just really vibrant products. And that's really a challenge for many of us as we're preparing products. But again, that's the goal here is to communicate this freshness uh, through the sensory stimulation. Um, I'm not here to make any political statement at all, only to say that a lot of us as consumers are looking for a, a company to really communicate, what's your social environmental uh, responsibility? What have you done as a company for me lately? Um, how can that possibly be communicated on your messaging? So this thing called CSR, your corporate social responsibility, is a program that many of us uh, have embraced uh, as part of what we do for our employees, how we deal with our water or wastewater, energy efficiency, and also maybe the packaging of our products, how it's sourced, um, how we might give back to the community with this purchase. Uh, Paul Newman, the Newman's Own, was one of the early adapters and the pioneers uh, saying all profits for charity. We're seeing Heinz with a, with a message for your purchase supports veterans, uh, M&Ms uh, supporting breast cancer. Um, so again, variety of ways in which your product could actually have a message. So it's called cause marketing to some, but again, it's all part of your social environmental message. You might also have other ways to communicate that. You might be a B Corporation, which is a, a focused a company that literally is incorporated around a social mission, uh, talking about reducing the carbon footprint or being focused on non-GMO um, or organic, uh, again, or recycled packaging. Uh, again, really incorporating what this describes as these three spheres of sustainability. Um, again, there's lots of, uh, uh, lots of great information on the website about this and how this can be incorporated in your company and in also your message to your consumers and how, again, you differentiate your product uh, to the marketplace. And lastly, I just want to talk about functional foods, um, which uh, this is a cool chart I found one day that really talks about the, the color coding nature of foods. Uh, with some of their potential outcomes. 
um, you know, in the red thing, as you'll see, tomatoes and lycopene, uh, and the orange about beta carotene uh, from carrots and other associated products, um, uh, uh, down to uh, blue and the blueberries and anthocyanin, um, free radicals, and so forth. So again, uh, early on, you know, the whole market, as we know, in the caffeinated beverages like Red Bull have evolved into other categories. This is a European product called Neuro. They have a product, in, in fact, called Neuro Passion, Neuro Sleep, Neuro Bliss. So again, they're incorporating functional ingredients into a beverage to provide some benefit. Of course, there's been um, uh, bacteria added to yogurts for uh, good intestinal health, uh, products like Good Belly as well. So again, there's, uh, there's a huge growth of functional foods that is certainly continues to evolve uh, as there's more science that's brought to the party. And, and even the USDA in, uh, back in 2011 updated their, uh, uh, their kind of icon for education uh, called MyPlate, talking about you know, how you can incorporate fruits, vegetables, and grains and proteins with a modest amount of dairy uh, into your diet, um, all of which results into you know, what I call this whole value added specialty foods. So the Specialty Food Association is, uh, uh, runs uh, the Fancy Food Show, which some of you might have been to. It's in New York and San Francisco every year. Get about 40,000 people. It's a great place to see a lot of relatively new companies that are out there with, that really do a great job at kind of distinguishing themselves. So a lot of companies that have actually resulted in some significant capital investments. I know a lot of investors go to the show. They're looking for the next good thing, the next best thing. And some of these products are actually uh, displayed at these kind of uh, shows. But they actually define specialty foods as products that exemplify quality, innovation, and or style in their category um, that might result from their originality, things I talked about, authenticity, ethnic or culture origin, specific processing, ingredients, limited supply, distinctive use, extraordinary packaging, or a specific channel of distribution, therefore maintaining a high perceived value and a premium price. That's what we're all talking about today, is how we can differentiate our products. Um, the next one in the time I have available, and I'll take time for questions at the end, I want to talk about technologies and how that also can be part of your, your story by how you can integrate technologies as well as some of the trends I described to differentiate your product in the marketplace. So we talked lastly about the MyPlate and the USDA's involvement in, in education. We also know that our federal government has a role in government regulations. Um, you know, with, uh, you know, we have the State Department of Health uh, in, in the various states in which we operate and also the USDA and FDA regulating products that are appropriate to, uh, to their area of oversight. Um, and also have many, many pages of regulations around labeling, country of origin, the definition of organic. I was looking earlier about the definition of medical foods, um, you know, the, the 21 CFR, nutrition facts, the size of the font. So, you know, government uh, uh, has uh, quite a role in how we can describe foods. Um, and they also, uh, our government through the CDC, um, is quite involved in determining how safe our foods are. And obviously the USDA and the FDA have a role in making sure that our foods are in fact safe. So I want to bring this up in the context of we want to differentiate our products with foods that uh, you know, really you know, distinguish themselves in the market, but uh, utilize technologies that do a few things that could, and sometimes the same technology can have two effects, make the product safer, make the product taste better for a longer period of time, or look better, not stale, not go rancid. So sometimes and sometimes not, there's an overlap in, in these areas. Just to mention that um, this is actually a better number than it was in the past. It used to, the number used to be 65 million people got sick every year. It's now down to 48 million. Uh, the government thinks it's because of, of their role in, in really uh, upping the ante and the amount of recalls, um, re also reducing, reduce, resulting in a reduced amount of people um, that actually get hospitalized or die from foodborne disease, contributes as much as $77 billion annually um, uh, the cost of foodborne illness in terms of medical expenses and lost wages. So the government obviously has taken an active role in here. And what's really happening uh, that's resulted in all these recalls, um, we all know uh, there's new FISMA regulation that's about to come out. There's enhanced regulatory focus. There's better detection systems. 
our population is getting older our, as our baby boomers are, more susceptible to foodborne illness. And because I talked about all this differentiating of foods, this is resulting in new combinations of ingredients. I actually once worked on a incorporation of seafood into a coleslaw. So you're taking a traditional product been sold for dozens of years and you put an ingredient that didn't used to belong there. And seafood by itself has an issue. You put seafood in a 30-day shelf life coleslaw, what happens? So, and we've actually dealt with that at Rutgers, you know, where people in, take ingredients that independently are fine, but you put them together, they don't necessarily like each other. And they, they create a new uh, uh, enhanced food safety concern. We also talked about one of the trends is cleaner labels. Well, cleaner labels means less preservatives. Less preservatives might mean a, you know, a, more of a risk for food safety. Um, we're also seeing new pathogens. We're seeing breakdowns in the cold chain. We're seeing increased urbanization in America uh, as uh, you know, we're putting farms that might be uh, reasonably close to, uh, uh, to a population of cattle, uh, and obviously that could be contaminated by manure. So, so you know, that therefore results in a, in a cross-contamination issue. Um, we're seeing allergens that are inadvertently uh, 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 not disclosed on labels, resulting in a class one recall. So again, there's a lot of things going on that we need to be very conscious about. And how we can you know, really deal with this is you know, the, what's been called hurdle technologies. This is kind of a proactive thing you can do in your arsenal of technologies to result in enhanced food safety or enhanced food sensory attributes. It may in fact give you a distinct competitive advantage and be part of your technology differentiation. So again, you know, there are various tools in the toolbox. Um, and it's been very, very well documented that one and one can equal three. By doing a couple of things together, you may find synergy uh, and your shelf life or your quality could be enhanced dramatically. So similarly to the way I described trends and having a number of them that I, that I felt were very relevant, um, the same thing applies to technologies. I'll list about six kind of categories. And we all have heard, might have heard the description or the description of the food industry the value chain as being from farm to fork, while well, technologies also work in the same model from farm to fork. So I'm going to talk to you about how technologies can be applied in your agricultural commodities, your raw materials, in your formulation. So you're buying raw materials, you're then going to maybe be at a kettle about to add them together. It's important what you do in the raw materials, it's important what you do in the kettle. Then you might process them in some way, you might package them in some way, you might distribute that in some way. Um, and overall, how does your facility deal with this and also embrace food safety and technology best practices to give you the best possible outcome? So I'll talk again about agricultural hurdles. It's all about uh, post-harvest handling, rapid cooling that retards microbial growth, recognizing that pathogens have been documented to be internalized via roots, flowers, stem scars, pores, channels, bruises, um, so in a, the, the, I've seen data in a field uh, in which pick a commodity, whether it's a basil or a tomato or what have you, um, uh, that's harvested, that a product taken from, literally say it was this table, from this part of the table to that part of the table, there might be uh, 10,000 times, the 10 to the fourth or fifth greater plate count or chiral counts of a pathogen even, from a product over here. Why? Maybe because the bird flew overhead. Maybe because this one you know, was affected by some sort of runoff. Maybe because there's a scar um, and that really served as a little reservoir for pathogen to grow. These are pictures from the, uh, these are pictures I believe from the USDA Agriculture Research Service that show biofilms. Biofilms are an amazing thing that bacteria like Listeria have created that makes them increasingly resistant to sanitation. So they, I'm a bacteria, they put this little wall up here, they work, they clump together, they put this little wall here that they create this little resistance um, to, you know, they need to, you need abrasion, you need to have the right chemicals, you need to shock them. Um, but these biofilms protect pathogens against bactericidal agents. These are biofilms actually shown growing on agricultural commodities. Um, so similarly, what we need to do is to really look at, you know, there's just lots of articles. Uh, here's one that talks about, you know, knowledge and on perspectives on biofilm formation, uh, in the case of the theory of monocytogenes. 
Um, but it's all about segregating your high risk and your low risk operations. So this is an example of pineapple. It's a factory I once worked in actually. So this pineapple might come in uh, on the raw side, go through the wall to a clean side. So you're separating uh, dirty from clean and through that there's these little blue brushes there. Uh, the product is going through a scrubbing mechanism on rollers. We're using uh, some sort of chlorine or parasitic acid or ozone or UV or other aids to wash the product. There's nothing that's guaranteed. We know all we're doing is reducing log growth. This is not a cure-all, but it's all, about, it's all about, again, multiple barriers that we're adding here, multiple hurdles to reduce the overall count uh, to make a difference on an incremental basis. So again, agricultural hurdles is kind of, you know, hurdle number one in this farm and fork model. Formulation, so these are acidulants or antimicrobial agents, could be natural or synthetic, or using things like irradiated spices, uh, or blanching your vegetables, uh, or, or some sort of dips that may, may be added to the product. Sometimes these dips are considered a processing aid and don't need to be labeled on the, on the formula, frankly, or the ingredient statement, uh, but, but some, sometimes they do. But these hurdles, again, here, here I am, you know, this right-hand picture, uh, making stuff in my batch. You know, what am I adding to that, that ingredient? Sodium lactate, nissen, liquid smoke. Uh, there's been lots of good data on how certain uh, preservatives uh, can have a specific effect against, say, listeria. Um, really documented a dramatic reduction. So again, there's lots of good science around this hurdles. This is a subject all unto itself. Uh, next is... Um, uh, processing hurdles, and I want to really talk about um, a couple of categories here, uh, both thermal and non-thermal. So, uh, you know, I learned about processing, it was mostly about heat. Um, we, 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 we cook a product in, at a certain temperature, 180, 185, 190, whatever, you know, we resulted in the product being pasteurized, you know, having an adequate amount of, uh, uh, of bacterial reduction to ensure, you know, some level of shelf life and safety. Uh, but that can be done in a number of ways. You could fill the product hot, or you could fill the product cold, and you could pasteurize the product once it's in the package, called sous vide or cooking casing. Uh, also, microwave pasteurization is the same concept, um, where the product receives heat uh, after it's been packaged, or it can be done before it's packaged. Obviously, retorting is taking that to a higher degree, incorporating um, a sterilization process through uh, higher temperatures yet and pressure. And aseptic processing is all a, a type of thermal processing uh, option for you, as opposed to non-thermal. A lot of growth at ultra high pressure processing, um, early adopter, uh, we all might know is guacamole, um, that uh, even though this, this science dates back to, I believe, the 1890s, um, and, uh, but was really uh, applied in the United States just in the past uh, 30, 40 years or so, and has evolved considerably into other categories of food. So we'll take, a guac take an avocado, for anybody, anybody who's ever made avocado, ever, I'm sorry, ever made a guacamole at home, uh, you know that avocado, when you cut it, it's got a life of seconds. Um, it starts to turn brown. So here we have a, a, a vacuum packaged guacamole product that has a shelf life of about 60 days, maybe even a little bit more, looks and tastes fresh. Similarly, this Evolution uh, product here, sold at Starbucks, purchased by Starbucks, has fresh squeezed, in, in quotes, orange juice that has been non, non uh, I'm sorry, ultra high pressure processed. So again, it actually has the effect, the bactericidal effect of heat, but using pressure instead. So a certain number of PSIs of pressure um, can result in the same thermal death uh, rate, if you will, uh, to bacteria yet the product never got heat and it actually tastes much fresher. So we're seeing that also being applied to things like shellfish. The product actually looks raw because it didn't get heat, um, but it has been pasteurized. So, so it's uh, arguably a raw looking fish um, that's actually been cooked with pressure. And, uh, and this process also results in the ability to have these product pre-shucked because it actually so much pressure, the product actually shucks itself. Um, so again, there's actually some exhibitors here at this conference uh, that ha have a high-pressure processing systems. You see that picture in the middle right, where the product typically is loaded in a basket, goes through a chamber. 
So it actually affords itself to a batch process, not a lot of volume, it needs to be done at one time. It's a reasonably expensive process, but again, uh, there's a lot of, uh, sorry, reasonably expensive equipment, but not a reasonably expensive process um, that allows you to uh, uh, utilize that technology. A radiation, impulse slide, or other categories that are non-thermal, um, they're still out there doing research and there's some applications, but certainly this UHP, also called HHP, is uh, an area that's uh, seen a lot of uh, interest in the food industry. Next is packaging. Um, so packaging is clearly a very critical and a very innovative area for food technology. You can't underestimate the amount of science, and this shows a great example. Uh, packaging is, takes a lot of know-how. There's so much, to, so much to deal with, and your packaging suppliers can offer that kind of service to you. But just some of the categories I talked about, uh, and just to provide a little bit of information about a lot of areas, is uh, MAP, uh, barrier packaging materials, active and intelligent packaging, and clean room environments. So MAP, uh, many of us may be familiar with the concept, but modified atmosphere, say this room, for example, let's pretend we modified atmosphere package this whole room. So this room right now is about 78% um, nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and less than 1% of other stuff. Um, so the, let's pretend we want to modify atmosphere package this whole room. We want to get to 78% oxygen, I'm sorry, the 21% oxygen, down to less than one or less than 0.1%. Um, so by reducing that oxygen, so we're seeing this kind of application in all sorts of ways, whether it's cooked chicken meat uh, or, back, or modified atmosphere packaged, uh, fresh pasta, dog food, coffee, it's in all categories where we're displacing the the air with an air that we chosen to be there instead. There's lots of uh, equipment suppliers here to help you learn more about this. Uh, you can do it horizontally, you can do it vertically, the drawer systems. Um, but again, we're trying to, to really result in that and arguably vacuum packaging is a form of MAP. Some would disagree, but you've done the same thing. You've reduced the amount of air. So I pull in a vacuum, I may still have 21% oxygen left, but I got very little PPMs of air, period. So I've, I've affected the same result. So whether you pull a vacuum or you create an environment of air and you back flush it, um, there's just a, a great contribution there in the fact that, and what's happening here, is bacteria that typically spoil products love oxygen. And the, and the bacteria that are slower growing uh, are, are, uh, are, uh, will grow instead. Um, we have to be conscious of the fact that some bacteria that are anaerobic, like botulism, Clostridium botulinum, favors this environment. So, so there's a, a certainly a, uh, in some states there's some issues uh, with uh, having a second barrier. So if you pull, remove the oxygen, uh, you want to make sure that you're not creating an environment in which botulism will now want to grow. So again, uh, food for thought. But uh, again, there's benefits and there's just uh, things to be uh, concerned about you know, as, if, as you embrace uh, MAP. But again, there's products, uh, again, you could have a, a low water activity or some other natural barrier that makes these kind of issues go away. Um, in the case of refrigerated pasta, I know the shelf life just through uh, intense monitoring of MAP resulted in a 50% increase in shelf life between one brand of refrigerated pasta and another. Um, that occurred through the, the equipment and the barrier film and so forth. So barrier films, real briefly, um, is all about oxygen transmission rate uh, and having the right kind of film material, the right kind of film thickness, uh, and you're trying to control this oxygen transmission rate as well as the moisture vapor transmission rate um, through gauge of film, OTR, MVTR. So, so these are things to think about as you're talking to packaging suppliers. Um, a lot of times our, our purchasing people will say, can't you get a cheaper film? Uh, well, yeah, you said, yeah, maybe I can, but we just lost 10% of our shelf life. What's that worth? So, so, so I think it's just really being very aware of the whole holistic nature of what these various things can do for you and being smart about that uh, will help you make a difference again. There's a number of companies here at the show actually that are out there with active intelligent packaging systems, uh, whether they're desiccants that uh, can do things by uh, absorbing oxygen or scavenging it or uh, removing odors, releasing ethanol, um, controlling uh, relative humidity. These things could be in the film. They could be in the form of a sachet. 
you know, they could be a time temperature indicator. There's, there's systems out there for uh, actually dealing with ripening. Um, that the product, you know, that'd be a very cool thing for all the people, all of us that purchase foods that are underripe and they never actually ripen. So it could actually be an indicator that indicates that the product is in fact ripened. Um, certainly, uh, steam release, venting, microwavable packaging, microperforated films, these are all some form of an active or intelligent packaging system that, if you will, is a smart packaging that is another great hurdle to incorporate into your system as just a component of packaging. And lastly, under, under packaging, I'll talk about clean room environment. That means that I talked about earlier when you have what's called a high care room. You had your, your, your raw produce, which I described earlier, and then it enters into a clean area. So how do I separate that raw area with that clean area? I could do that through air filtration, um, using HEPA filters or MERV-8 or higher room filters, air purification systems. There's companies here too uh, that actually utilize UV or, or, or photocatalytic oxidation or ozone to purify the air using positive air pressure, thinking about your makeup air, testing your air with microbial testing systems as part of your environmental monitoring program, all things to do in that consideration. Uh, next, I want to talk about temperature control. So we've all done a great job. We've separated raw from cooked. You know, we've used great formulation, barrier hurdles all the way through. Frankly, here's an area where we may lose control. So, so we all know that we're only as good as what happens until the product leaves our control. So it's all about distribution. So we want to control, we talked before already, to recap how important it is to cool the product at point of harvest, in the field, receive it cold, produce it cold if it needs to be cold, um, keep it in holding coolers, and you know, all the way through, store merchandisers, the, the consumer's trunk, um, the consumer's refrigerator, we can't control everything. But I just want to really, my story here is this last thing in italics, that many of us keep our coolers in our plants at 40 degrees or 41 degrees as required by the state health department or what have you, FDA, you can do better than that. So there's a lot of good data that I've seen over the years, this thing called super chilling, really pioneered in Japan, but it's really a way to uh, keep the product just above the freezing point. So the, you know, for example, poultry freezes at not 32, but 28.6 degrees. That's why you'll see sometimes a little bit of ice on, on poultry in your supermarket refrigerator group because they're shipping that at that temperature, about 29 degrees. Um, so there's a lot of data that shows that you can actually get a 50% to 200% increase in shelf life if you did a test of a product at 30 degrees versus 40 degrees. It's substantial. Um, in addition, we know organisms like Listeria, uh, even though it's extremely cold tolerant, won't grow at these really cold temperatures. So again, the more we can keep the product at these ex more extreme cold temperatures, closer to 32, 33, obviously it depends on what exactly you're storing. Some products um, don't like that, that to be that cold. But just to be conscious, I call it a 29 to 35 as a range to consider to keep your product as cold as possible versus 40. And kind of lastly, just uh, as in this presentation, to really talk about facility design, we talked about controlling cross-contamination, separating raw from cooked, being conscious about allergen control, and ready to eat and ready to eat, ready to cook products uh, that, that, that shouldn't necessarily be co-located, just like at home and Thanksgiving, you're not gonna cut your poultry right next to your lettuce you're serving your guests, uh, or you certainly shouldn't, because you have the bacteria which we know are on that poultry, uh, that then get into that ready to eat lettuce. So how do you deal with that with your own plant? By keeping separation, segregation, sanitation to really uh, you know, prevent, at least mitigate, the potential for cross-contamination. So sanitary design is critical. You, know, you might accomplish this by, uh, by having like a frying operation where you have raw chicken, you go through a, a hole in the wall into a cooked area. Um, similarly, you might have your raw employees be different than your cooked employees. So the people don't even take breaks together. They go through a separate area when they put on boots. So there's lots of best practices around design. These bottom right pictures so a clean room operation where this person is actually assembling a refrigerated kebab um, and that product then goes through a wall where the product is packaged. So this environment, there's no corrugated, there's no pallets, they're all dirty. 
So only thing in this room is cooked, you know, or, or, or prepared uh, product that is cleaned, and then the product actually gets cased outside the wall. So we're talking about being focused on drains and drain covers. These are all my personal pictures, and I've done some third-party audits um, that uh, uh, have been evident to determined to be uh, sources of uh, significant pathogen contamination in many areas, uh, conscious of wall interfaces and junctions. Here's a ventilation system that's right next to a packaging room in a clean environment that you know, was not clean, not properly sealed, and was in fact found to be the source of, uh, of, of an E. coli issue at this factory. You know, it's wood, fiber, other contaminants that could be in your factory or glass. Bad welds and seals is a real no-no to all USDA inspectors. These are actual welds, it's hard to believe, with pinholes in them, uh, which bacteria growth and pathogens have been found in various uh, factory visits. Or seeing a nice clean operation cutting produce with uh, a really poor overhead repair right above this operation, dripping condensation. Uh, that bottom left ugly looking picture is the inside of a drain that was right into a packaging room, uh, which was never part of the sanitation program. Backed up drains, uh, areas where condensation can't evacuate. This is actually the source of a listeria outbreak in another factory, which was the intersection of these joints on the floor. This is in the floor itself, where these little puddles of water were there and never, it was always wet. Um, it was an obvious spot for me, and that was not uh, recognized. And uh, just, just a, a little repair there actually helped alleviate that problem. So at the end of the day, it's about really incorporating the principles of, of GFSI, this Global Food Safety Initiative, um, and having you know, all these principles in place when it comes to facility design and procedures that lead to the, you know, the kind of performance we're talking about. Um, so I know I give you a lot of information. Uh, slides are available. This is my contact information, and uh, again, we're, we're here at the show at booth 951, um, and uh, I'm also speaking tomorrow on the topic of food incubators um, for those who are interested in that as well, and uh, have time for maybe just maybe two questions, and then the next person needs to come on. Questions?